voices of the past. Links of a broken chain. Wings that can bear me back to times which cannot come again. Yet God forbid that I should lose the echoes that remain. It is hard for anyone to walk here, let alone to attempt to explain the life of some of those who perished here. How does one retrace these steps, reverse the trains to take you back beyond the furnace, to catch a glimpse of their world, the world that was, a world in which so many spent their youth and the best years of their lives, particularly the lives of those who lived in the little villages, the shtetls. of them barely dotting the map. Then one day, they were all gone. Only echoes remain of that special world. There was Prague and its ancient synagogues and art. Krakow, where the ordinary cobbler conversed in the Talmud. Bells, where Hasidim flocked to spend the holy days with their Rebbe. The city's lodge in Lemberg, where merchants and peddlers hurried home from the morning prayers to open their factories and peddle their wares. Each had its Jewish dimension, each a Jewish pulse.
Warsaw, the center of Jewish learning and commerce. Berlin of science and philosophy. Salonika, where Jewish stevedores and dockers maintained a thriving port under the warm Mediterranean sun. But it was the ordinary things that one remembers about that world. The books, old and tattered, many with names and birth dates carefully handwritten as if they were markers on a road stop along the way, and as if those who wrote them hoped somebody would stop to remember them as they passed by. They were everywhere. Even the poor reserved a place of honor in their home for a shelf of books. And when a child was ready to begin immersing himself in study, his father would wrap him at a prayer shawl like a Torah scroll, and with family and friends carry him off to Cheda to keep a rendezvous with wisdom. Even babes were rocked to sleep with lullabies of learning. Who can forget the image of the child without shoes? His mother holding him tightly, trying to shield him from the bitter cold as she carries him off to Cheda. Outside, she knows her son is a pauper, but when she opens the Cheda doors, she's convinced he could one day be a prince. Inside the dark and dimly lit room, reminiscent of thousands of little hamlets, sits Reb Zizel, the Malamed, expounding to us the virtues of life. About selfishness, Reb Zizel says, if you look through a window, you will see the world. But if you cover it with silver, it becomes a mirror. And then all you can see is yourself. About arrogance, he teaches. Once I asked a young man what he was doing with his life. The lad answered me, I have already gone through the whole Talmud. I see, I replied. But may I ask you, has the Talmud ever gone through you? And when some beseeched him that there were too many commandments, Reb Zizel would stroke his beard and shake his head in indignation. Maybe you can tell me my class of geniuses, eh? Why Adam, when he was in the Garden of Eden, was given only one commandment to observe, namely not to eat from the tree of knowledge. Do you know why, my geniuses? because the Almighty in his wisdom wanted to teach us that even when Adam had only one commandment, he still felt that it was too hard to keep. From this, we learn that for a sinner, a single law is one law too many.
Through the heat of the full summer days and the frost of the cold winter nights, life in the shtetl was lived as if it were some dream. And we were ascending and descending from hope to despair, climbing from rung to rung on Jacob's biblical ladder. Before long, the tender childhood days were gone. It was time to be called to the Torah as a bar mitzvah. His mother cried when she heard Reb Feivel the Sixth and called out her son's Hebrew name, adding for the first time the traditional title, Future Groom. <laughs> On that day, the young man would stand alone and deliver his pilpul, a Talmudic discourse before the learned of the community. Why is it that the site of the temple wall today in Jerusalem is considered much more sacred than Mount Sinai, where God himself gave Moses the Ten Commandments? Because, let me explain as follows, on Har Sinai, on Mount Sinai, it was Ribon no Shalolom that did everything. It was God who did the work, while man remained passive. But on the Beis HaMikdash, the Temple Mount, it was different. There, man seized the initiative and built it. And that is what the Torah teaches us, that when man is the partner in God's work, then the Kedusha, the holiness of the event, is considered much more sacred. And soon, before the young man turned around, the sexton's words seemed prophetic, for there they were readying the canopy poles. The shtetl was going to have another wedding. Ah, how memorable the weddings were in that world. So many wonderful customs. In Lourdes, a grandmother began working on the trousseau for her granddaughter when she was 10 years old. Do you know why I'm making two of them? She asked her inquisitive grandchild. One will be yours, and the other I will give to the orphanage. Gedenk, mein Kind. As mitit for a andra, was mitit for sich, wird min zweimal gebencht. Remember, my child, if what you do for yourself you do for the poor, you will be doubly blessed. In our shtetl, when Rachel the orphan married Pinchas, the rabbi's son, the whole town was on Spilkes. On the day of the wedding, the town assembled by the edge of the cemetery, where the bride went to show respect to her departed mother, the righteous Esther Nahama, who died of pneumonia leaving her alone at the age of 14. Slowly, she made her way toward the grave, her mind overwhelmed by thoughts of her departed mother. Oi, my dear mama. Oh, my dear mother, she began as she reached the gravesite. How much you suffered before God in his wisdom finally took pity and ended your life. But today, mama, I know you will be happy. I've come to tell you, today is my wedding. Mazel tov, Mama, Mazel tov. The bride sobbed as she rubbed her hands along the rough edge of the tombstone. Mama, sei stolz, be proud. If only you were here to see this. The whole shtetl is waiting to escort your daughter to the chuppa. Ich hab nicht verschämt dein guten Numan. I have not embarrassed your good name. Go and tell Zedi Mama that today their little Rachel is marrying a prince of the Torah. And soon, Mama, with God's help, there will be someone to carry your illustrious name. This was our custom. 
When there was a wedding, everything stopped. Business trips were set aside, old quarrels were settled. The rich and poor would line the streets to watch the candlelit procession. First came the chassan, then the kala, preceded by musicians and minstrels. They would make their way through the dirt-covered streets, past the clusters of straw-covered homes, and finally to the synagogue courtyard, where were the heavens as witness they were sanctified as man and wife. Reb Zalman, the shatchan, stood there beaming over his match. You see, I was right. This is the natural way, he said, clutching his own umbrella. First you marry, then there'll be plenty of time to love. Don't misunderstand me. In that world, life was surely no picnic, and the shtetl was not inhabited by angels. There were selfish people and even cruel people, and there was much hardship and suffering. In the marketplace, many a vendor waited all day in vain for a customer, and many a father journeyed to distant places in search of a living. His family would wait his return for days as someone awaits the Messiah. From a distance, they watched his every step, searching for a hint of whether there would be food on their table. In some places, there was such poverty that children knew only the taste of potatoes. To make light of it, they would tell themselves the story of Herschel Ostropola. One night, thieves broke into Herschel's home. They searched, they looked high and low, they turned the house topsy-turvy, they hunted in every corner, but they found nothing. Meanwhile, Herschel's wife heard the strangers prowling through the house. She quietly nudged Herschel. Herschel, Herschel, wake up! I'm not asleep, he answered. Don't you hear? There are thieves in the house. Shh, shh. He shushed her to be quiet. I know, but I'm burning with shame. There isn't even anything for them to take. If that wasn't enough hardship, then consider the fact that Jews were everybody's scapegoats trampled upon by drunken landowners and ruthless tyrants, and kept in ghettos by unfair laws and restrictions. Hardly a year would pass when Jews weren't the victims of some pogrom. I remember it like yesterday. Once when the shtetl bid farewell to Maud Chabert, he put up such a brave front, smiling and acting happy. But me he could not fool. After all, we were lifelong friends. I knew the truth about Berle, as we used to call him. I knew Berle left for America to help his parents out of their miserable lot. After all, when the log fell on his father, Reb Fischl, it left him a cripple and forced the family to live off the Kahilas Gamilas Chesed, the community charity fund. It was too much every day to sit and watch the sadness written on his father's face. And so, my friend Berla left for America at the age of 16 to try to make things better. <laughs> what shall I tell you? For four years he stayed there, living as a boarder in a tenement house on the Lower East Side, working long hours in a sweatshop and forced to give up keeping the Sabbath. He felt so content each week when he sent home money to his family. And before a holiday, he would manage to include a little more. As long as I live, I'll never forget what happened when Berla booked his passage home on the White Star Liner. He was so happy he had saved an additional $700 which he had sewn around his belt. God is my witness that I did not want to go with Reb Yeruchim and the other elders to tell Berla what happened. Why did the ship have to take four weeks? I asked myself over and over. In the end, I wouldn't be able to look at myself. So I went with them when the elders told him about the tragedy. The pogrom instigated by the National Radical Camp, the ONR, that took the lives of his family and nine others, all murdered on Rosh Choyde Shvat when Berla was on the ship home. I never heard such cries of anguish. He was never the same again after that. Berla blamed himself for staying too long, for having dreamed too big a dream. He wouldn't hear of it when we told him how noble his deed was, what respect he showed for Reb Fischl, his father. 
He would never come to shul. I only saw him when I sometimes accompanied him on his visit to place stones on their graves. Then, when the war broke out and I ran to the forest, Berela just stayed in the home he built near the cemetery. So now it falls on me that whenever I pass through the shtetl, I fulfill his custom of placing stones on his family's grave. I'll tell you, I would place some for my friend Berla as well, if I only knew where the murderers buried him. But amidst all their problems, they always found time to laugh and sing. Everyone sang in the shtetl, the yeshiva student poring over the Talmud, the tailor sewing his pair of trousers, the cobbler when he mended a pair of his shoes. And who didn't laugh? After all, merriment was the glue that kept their sanity intact. And what choice was there anyway? Who had the money to travel to Vienna to tell their tsurus to Sigmund Freud? Once, there was this aged chassid who never looked at women. One day, he went to visit his niece. Please give me a glass of tea, he said, looking away from her deliberately. Only when a strange but pleasant voice asked, is it strong enough? Only then did he realize that he had entered the wrong dwelling. The people of the shtetl didn't have business cards or telephone directories. They had only their names, but their names were special. Who called the person by his second name? They would identify each other by profession or physical characteristic. There was Beryl Hunchback, Zalik Taylor, Hamsha Balagula, who was one of the town's wagon drivers. There was Aaron, a quiet and shy man. Do you know what he was called? Aaron Stiller. And Label, the strong man who wanted to be a wrestler. Him they called Label Soldat. And when there were two people with the same first name, there was a simple solution. The taller one was called the Reusermottel, and the smaller one, the Kleinermottel. Somehow it didn't matter much that the taller one was only five foot four because the shorter one was five foot two. You see, the Greusser Muttel would always say, big is in the eye of the beholder. A man's height was something to remember him by. Even in cemeteries, the gravestones were specially made to fit the height of the deceased. And in life, there was such wit in their expressions. When a man came upon a river that seemed endless, he would give a krechts. Oi si zazoi lang vi de gulis. Oh, it's as long as our exile. When something was too heavy to lift, he bemoaned. Oi si zazoi schwer vi unser It's as heavy as our suffering. Even anger was expressed uniquely. Who needed to be vulgar when wisdom could be found even in cursing? You should lose all your teeth except one, and that one should ache. Or when tempers really got the better of them, you should be like a lamp. You should hang all day and burn all night. And when a man fell on hard times and his muzzle or luck ran away from him, there was faith and even some philosophy in his despair. Baruch the Malamed was a teacher who didn't have enough children to teach. So what could he do? He began fixing stoves. He still didn't make enough money fixing stoves. So, he started selling shirts. And when that didn't work, he made shoes. When he was asked why he is such a nebbish, he would answer, God wants to be good to me. I'm sure he always sends an angel to help me. But when he sends the angel to help Baruch the Malamed, I'm already fixing my stoves. When he gets to the stoves, I'm already fixing shoes. One day, I'm sure my angel will catch up with me.
It's difficult to explain to people what that world was. How each night laborers and peasants, tradesmen and merchants, would return from a hard day in the fields and in the forests to flock to the small shul for a few hours of study and a little taste of the eternal. There they would rub their hands to rid themselves of the cold before opening the large tomes and immersing themselves in another world. A world where ideas were regarded as treasures and where piety was a sign of nobility. Where a wagon driver immersed in his text felt himself equal to the kings and princes of the realm, and where a six-year-old's voice quivered with excitement as he began his journey through history, a journey that found him one day in King Solomon's majestic temple, and the next day in the great academies of ancient Babylon. The candlewicks that burned steadily in the shul were never used to advance careers or obtain degrees. They glowed for those who learned purely for the sake of learning. Sometimes, Rebbe Chamaya would sit with his grandson and extol to him the parables of the Magad of Dubnau. Do you hear, my Chaimel, what the Magad says? Why is it that a rich man would rather give charity to a poor man who is blind or lame over a poor man who is a Talmudic scholar? Ah, the old man implored with a gleam in his eye, because the rich man isn't sure. Perhaps one day he himself, through some accident, might become blind or lame. But one thing a rich man can be certain of, he will never be a Talmudic scholar. And in the synagogue near the tea kettle, which during the winter was the only source of heat, sat Reb Yaakov Kopo, a devoted chosid of the Rebbe of Ger. Every time he returned from a visit to his Rebbe's court, where thousands of chassidim from all over the world had gathered, he would hum the new melody he learned all the way home on the wagon so that he could introduce it to the shtetl. From there, a stranger would inevitably hear it and take it to his town. Believe me, even without a tape recorder, a good nigan traveled everywhere. There was a story told of this chosid who was desperately afraid that he would forget his Rebbe's new nigan. He sat there on the train, humming his nigan, oblivious to the conductor's warning to remove the baggage from the seat next to him. Once more, the conductor warned him sternly. Remove the baggage or I'll throw it out of the window. But the chassid paid no attention. The conductor angrily picked up the baggage and threw it out of the open window of the moving train. Only to hear the chassid look up at him and say, That's not my suitcase. Even now, as we look back from the distance of time, we cannot resist bringing into focus those whose voices have been stilled, whose fingers once reverently caressed these tones, and who, in their haste to look up a quote, tore off the top corner of a page, or who, in the cold winter nights, spilled their hot tea, causing water stains here and there. 
One can still hear the heated Talmudic exchanges, which went on endlessly into the night. Therefore, man was created as a single individual in order to teach him that for his sake the whole world was created. But Ramele, how can the Gemara say that? On the very next page, the Gemara tells us, Odom Nivro Berev Shabbos, that man was created last, just before the Sabbath on the sixth day, in order to teach him humility, that ye toish kodam chobamah seberashis, that even a simple worm was created before him. Rabnute, du sind nicht das Tiere? There is no contradiction. A man should be an honor. He should be humble. But he should also accept Achraya's responsibility that this world was created for him, but created for him to use wisely. This method of deductive reasoning, searching for deeper insights studied in the base Medrish, permeated the entire life of the shtetl. Women used it in normal conversation. Once a woman ran to ask her neighbor to loan her a pot for cooking meat. Congratulations, Mazel Tov! So, when will the wedding be? How did you know? said the woman. Why shouldn't I know? You have a meat pot of your own, so if you're borrowing mine, you're going to cook a lot of meat. But who eats meat in the middle of the week? So, you must have something to celebrate. But you have a sick husband and two sons out of work, so what is there to celebrate? But you also have a daughter, may the evil eye not fall on her, who is of the age to marry. So, I say to myself, that must be it. So, Mazel tov. may she live in good health with her chosen, and may you have much joy from them and many fine grandchildren. And charity, Sedoka, played a special role in their lives. When Chana, the beggar's wife, gave birth to a son, her husband, Avrumsha, rushed off to the synagogue to distribute alms. You see, today I have the chance to be the rich man, he greeted everyone who wished him Mazel Tov. And at a wedding, who didn't observe the custom of setting tables aside for the poor and for strangers? And when Shabbos and the holidays came, mother would say, As ma bring time a nuri man, hot boss kugel and andra tam. If you bring home a poor person, then even the kugel tastes different. I can still see her, my dear mother of blessed memory, standing on her feet all day, preparing the fish and kugel for the Shabbos meal, singing to herself quietly a Sabbath melody. And when there wasn't enough food and she wanted to signal the family to take smaller portions so as not to embarrass the guests, she would look at us and with a smile say, Kinderlach, dem Shabbos sollen die Ochem essen und ein bissel singen und ihr soll euch Gott benschen. Ihr sollt singen und ein bissel essen. Listen, my children. This Shabbos let the guests eat and sing a little, and you, may God bless you, you should sing and eat a little. When a young man was sent away to study, he became totally dependent on such invitations. Each night he would be invited to another home. At times he would feel guilty because he knew he was taking away food from families that needed it. This was especially so when Brindle the widow with four children invited him. Come now, why do you want to deprive me of my rarity in the world to come, she would insist. Who could debate such idealism? But on the other hand, nobody wanted to be guilty of being like Reb Skrulsha's guest. In the yeshiva, they would tell this story about a certain Reb Skrulsha, who brought home guests every Shabbos. One time when the chicken soup was served, one of his guests was so hungry that he dunked his challah bread in the soup, soaking it all up, and then proceeded to ask his hostess for another portion. The hostess was frantic that there wouldn't be enough soup to go around. Quickly, she whispered to her husband, Please, say something. Reb Srolcha hesitated, scratched his beard, and then finally looked up at his guest and declared, you know, I always wondered why did the Almighty have to work so hard to split the sea? The Israelites should have distributed chalas and instructed everyone to dunk them in water until the sea was parted. 
The guest, still licking his plate without looking up, replied, Reb Srulcha? What kind of a question is that? Did you forget the Jews went out of Egypt on Passover? And on Pesach, it was prohibited to have challah. One of the fondest memories was the Shabbos. All week the shtetl worried, what will be with the world, our livelihood, our families? Then Shabbos descended, that oasis in time when the whole town seemed to slip away from the ordinary in search of the profound. On that day, rather than conquer, the shtetl withdrew to a very special island, an island found deep within the soul. It was every Jew's weekend retreat. Sometimes in the winter, one could peer through the frost-covered windows just to catch a glimpse of the flickering flames which emanated from everywhere and convince himself that some distant being looking down from the galaxy could never hope to see a brighter constellation. So it was on Passover each house scrubbed clean and pure. In one sat Reb Yisachadoyev, the scribe, at the head of the Seder table, leaning like royalty on his pillow, bedecked in a long white kittle, urging his six-year-old Manashola to ask him the four questions. Why is this night of Passover different than all other nights of the year? And on the festival of Sukkot, when everyone moved from their permanent dwelling places into a temporary booth, it was to acknowledge that mortal men must not squander time, for they too are but temporary residents here. Or on Shavuos, the anniversary of the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, when like angels they would stay up all night studying, when they were no longer able to continue without dozing off, Reb Yorucham, the elder of the shtetl, would gather the young boys around and tell them wonderful parables so full of wisdom. There was this Yosef Mendel, he once told them, who all his life was poor and wanted nothing else but to own his own pair of woolen pants. From place to place he searched in vain, but always the answer was the same. A good pair of pants would be more rubles than Yosef Mendel, the woodcutter, earned in a year. One day, as he went to a Yerid in Zhikov, a miracle happened. A Gavir's wife took pity on him and gave him an extra pair of her husband, the Hoycha Shloima, Shloima the Giant's pants. Quickly, he ran home to tell his good fortune to his life's partner, Hudel. Hudel, he said, all my life I waited for this. Now all you have to do, my Nataira Hudel, is make them shorter. After all, they belong to the Hoycha Shloima. Yosef Mendel, have you lost your senses? Don't you know this is Thursday night? Will the fish and kugel cook themselves for Shabbos? Leave the pants. The shul will still be there next Shabbos for all to see you in your new pants. Ay, Yosef Mendel moaned as he hit upon an idea. Hanala, Hanna Rivka, he called to his daughter. You know how long I've dreamed of this. Please, Hanala, make me these pants in time for Shabbos. But Tata, you know I can't. Did you not tell me that nothing is more important than studying the Torah? Well, what do you want me to do? Tomorrow is Friday, the time for the Rebbe's test on the weekly portion, and I have not even begun studying. Well, maybe it is not meant to be for now, said Yosef Mendel, as he picked himself up and soon retired for a good night's sleep, placing his new pants beside him on the chair. 
It was in the middle of the night when Hulala began twisting and turning. <sighs> One husband God has given me. It means so much to him. And because of Kugel, I turned him down. Quietly, she made her way to the scissors, taking with her Yosef Metal's new woolen pants. Then, with such pride and diligence, she cut off a foot from Yosef Mendel's pants before returning to her sleep. Honor thy mother and father, a disturbing voice interrupted his daughter Hannah Rifka's sleep. How could I have been so disrespectful? She told herself as she tiptoed away to the scissors, taking with her a measuring board and laughing as she thought of her father and the Hoika Schleimer's pants. She worked diligently by the kerosene lamp, cutting away almost two feet before she sewed the last stitch and quietly went back to her dreams. As dawn set in, Josef Mendel set aside his disappointments. Instinctively, he reached for his new pants by the chair and then ran outside to again try them on in the light. To his utter amazement, there he was standing before his maker in a pair of shorts. Oh, good Lord, he exclaimed. What would I have done if my pants were only an inch or two too long? Then I'm afraid I would be standing naked before you. Thank God they were so very long. No matter how much they were cut, at least I still have a pair of shorts. So it is with life, Rab Yerucham concluded. The more you study Torah now, the longer your protective garb in life. When you step outside and the world begins cutting away, if your garment was very long, at least you'll know that no matter how much they cut away, the core will always remain. And the high holidays, how does one describe the week before Rosh Hashanah? It was a custom to go to the Heiligerot, the cemetery, reciting psalms at the graves of loved ones or great sages of Israel, beseeching them to intercede on our behalf to the heavenly throne that we may be inscribed for the coming year in the Book of Life, placing little rocks on the tombstones as our ancestors did before us when they visited a sacred place. And when the day of judgment, Rosh Hashanah, came, children would watch their mothers and fathers with tears in their eyes formally shake hands and wish each other Eitechoi sagut un gebenstior fadir und der Kinder und ganz klar Yisrael May you pray out for yourself and the children and the whole house of Israel a good and blessed year. And off they went to listen to the cantor's haunting rendition of And on Rosh Hashanah it is written down, and on Yom Kippur it is sealed. Who shall live and who shall die? When one looked at Dovidal the Hatmaker during this prayer, one had the feeling that only his likeness was present. But he himself had ascended somewhere else on high. I shall never forget how Yom Kippur came to a close in our shtetl. When the final note of the shofar was sounded, we all clasped hands, formed circles, and despite our weakness from fasting all day, sang until we were hoarse. Reb Luzer the Gabbai would shout, Kum Jiden Lama tanzen! Come, Jews, let us dance! Lama gesegen sich mit unser Städtel! Let us say farewell to the Städtel! Lama singen zusammen, let us sing together! Soll schon kommen der Gula, soll schon kommen der Gula! Oh, let our redemption be at hand! Let our redemption be at hand! My father's best friend, Reb Baruch Mordechai the Milkman, would continue singing until he reached his home across the courtyard from the synagogue. There, his custom was to break the fast on a glass of tea and kichel his wife had prepared, 
and begin the new year with the mitzvah of putting up his sukkah. As his wife and children looked on, he would put up the boards and pray, Oh God, grant me just once the privilege of putting up this sukkah in the holy city of Jerusalem. Then, as winter set in, came the festival of Hanukkah, when besides the kindling of the menorah and the spinning of the dreidel, the big event was inviting the whole cheder to the annual Hanukkah for praying at the home of the town's only teacher, Reb Zizel. Most of them brought him Hanukkah gelt as a gift. And then, when the word went out that his wife, Pesha, made such terrible latkes, all of us would manage to bring our own latkes as presents. As much as we tried to fool her, in the end there was no mistaking the fact that everybody's latkes were eaten but almost all of hers remained. I must say, some of us who had felt our teacher's wrath took some comfort in knowing that Pesha could be counted on to force Reb Zizel to eat all those terrible latkes. And poor Reb Zizel, he was stuck. He was too pious to tell a lie, and he was too afraid to tell her the truth. So he used to say to her, Oi, oi, Pesha, hadusatam. Does this have a taste? And on Purim, when we had a double obligation to be happy and merry, and at the same time to blot out the memory of Haman, who wanted to destroy all the Jews, we went to Shul and listened carefully to the Megillah from the Book of Esther, waiting anxiously for the reader to intone the name of Haman, so we could let loose our groggers and stamp our feet. For 45 years I kept Zora Freil's memory to myself. I'm sure there were many such memories. I accidentally discovered her secret when I was 11 years old, just after the Stadler was covered by the winter's first snow. Father had told me of the importance of memorizing the biblical chapter that contains the Ten Commandments, and I only needed a few more verses to finish the task. So one day, I rose before the others, who still lay bundled close to the old stove, the younger ones positioned closer than the older ones in accordance with father's instructions. I had just got dressed when someone opened the front door, letting in a gust of cold winter air. Who could be up so early, I said to myself, knowing that father always attended the second minion in the synagogue and the others were still very much sound asleep. I opened the door but could not make out the shadow of the person walking in the direction of the cluster of houses in the middle of the Stadler. I don't know what came over me, but I bundled myself up and decided to follow. After about 200 yards, I stumbled upon the secret. The person making her way in the direction of the Blinda Yankel's home was my mother. From afar, I could see her unbuttoning her coat, taking something out and putting it in front of the blind man's door. Quickly I circled around, reaching the home from the opposite direction, and bent down to see what my mother had left. It was the rest of the cake that we were not permitted to eat, and a good slice of herring and black bread. Every day my mother would rise before dawn, to take something to the Blinda Yankel. I don't think he ever knew whose food he was eating, and one day I even heard him say to himself as he bent down to pick it up, Oi, Geben Solz zu sein. Oh, blessed should the person be. I felt so ashamed of myself for thinking Mother was frugal and at times even unfair, leaving so much food for herself. I didn't know how every last crumb was carefully apportioned, not only for her husband and seven children, but for the Blinda Yankel as well. Many times I wanted to embrace her and say how proud I was to be her daughter. 
I never told anyone my mother's secret of Tzadoka Basesa, of giving charity anonymously. Even though from that day on she was more than Sora Fredel, the person who gave me life and nourishment, she became my teacher, my compass in life, my spirit. She too was among those who perished in the Holocaust, walked those final steps to the gas chamber. I can't help but think that when she arrived at the heavenly throne, it was with the perfect knowledge that here on earth, no one ever betrayed her secret of having been a blind man's friend. Yes, this was the world that was. The world of wooden synagogues and splintered benches, of poor people and of rich souls. While for many the shtetl was home, many other Jews left the shtetl for the largest cities and towns, where they distinguished themselves as soldiers and leaders of government, lawyers and judges, as physicians and even Nobel laureates. Jews helped invent dye and the airship, discovered the theory of relativity and the creation of ammonia. They were gifted composers and dramatists, as well as, of course, teachers and philosophers. Their minds could be seen at work in the Hauptwache in Frankfurt. Their pens authored works of endurance near Ringstrasse in Vienna. Their skills crafted new styles in the factories of Hauswachtagplatz in Berlin. There were all types of Jews. A Herzl who called us home to Zion. An Einstein who summoned us to unlock the universe. A Freud who implored us to explore the mind. Each harnessing within them that flickering flame that glowed in the shtetl, that first caught Abraham's attention in the land of Canaan, that found Moses at the burning bush, that inspired the prophets to seek justice. In every generation, there were those who wanted to put out that flame. In our generation, they almost succeeded. Many times those who survived have asked themselves why they were spared. Most do not know why. Some see it as an obligation to keep alive the memories destined for oblivion. That, my friends, is a little glimpse of the Shtetla, a composite of her characters and her legends. She is quiet now, her voice still forever. A street here and there, a few old houses, some twisted rubble. New grass has covered over what once was. The Chede where Reb Zizel taught. The synagogue where Rabbi Shemaya prayed. The main street where all these wonderful people who shaped our lives once walked. were told of Reb Strulcher and Herschel, where Zolman the matchmaker dreamed of his matches, where the Maggot of Dubnau and Reb Yeruchim told their magnificent parables, and where the sounds of Torah permeated the walls of the academy 
and where the prayers of holy men assail the heavens. My task is complete now. I have passed that legacy on to you. The memory is yours now. Hold on to it with pride and remember, it is the only monument that world will ever have. When the sage Rabhananya was wrapped in the Torah scroll and burned at the stake by the Romans, a student called out to him, Master, what do you see? As the flames engulfed him, Rab Hananya replied, Only the parchment burns, but the letters, the letters ascend to the heavens.